Good day. Thank you for tuning in to this 2018 General Election Candidate Forum for State Representative 22nd Legislative District Position 1. The forum is presented by the League of Women Voters of Thurston County and Thurston Community Media. The League is a nonprofit organization that encourages and the informed and active participation of citizens in their government. The League neither supports nor opposes candidates or parties. We are nonpartisan. The League registers new voters, works to get out the vote, studies issues, and advocates for its positions with governing bodies. Despite its name, the League is open to both men and women of age 16 and up. I'm Allison Brooks from the League, and I'll be moderating this forum. The candidates for State Representative 22nd Legislative District Position 1 are Lori Dolan and C. Davis. For this forum, each candidate will have two minutes for an opening statement. Then I will ask them questions in alternating order. The person first asked the question will have two minutes for a response, followed by one minute from the other candidate. There will be one minute for closing statements at the end. We will begin with opening statements from the candidates, beginning with C. Davis, followed by Lori Dolan. C. Davis, welcome. Lori Dolan, welcome. C., you have two minutes for your opening statement. My name is C. Davis, and I'm running for Washington State Representative in the 22nd Legislative District, position number one. I would like to thank the League of Women Voters for making this forum available, and I would like to thank the audience for taking time from your busy schedules to become more informed voters and allowing me to share my ideas of how to make Washington better for all of us. I would also like to take a moment to recognize any veterans who may be watching were it not for the great sacrifices of our veterans, we would not be having the upcoming election. We would not have a country were it not for their sacrifices. It's due to them that our great experiment of liberty continues. Um, I have lived in Washington 25 years. I enjoy the climate and the uh, beauty the state affords. I have worked in information technology for over 20 years. I have done most of this in the corporate sector. I understand how big systems work. I understand how to make them work efficiently. Uh, I have also owned two stores in my lifetime. And so I am very close to the notions of what's involved with operating a small businesses and the challenges of running a small business. I attended Evergreen State College and received a degree in mathematics. So I'm also familiar with the challenges that face our students, both in the job market and in the cost of education. Um, I'm running because I believe the significant need of the working men and women and small business and entrepreneurs of our state has not been met and their needs must be prioritized. Thank you. Thank you. Lori, you have two minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Allison. My name is Lori Dolan, and for the past two years, I've had the honor as serving as one of your two state representatives from the 22nd Legislative District. When I came to this job two years ago, I brought 30 years of experience in K-12 education. At the age of 21, I started out teaching some of the poorest first graders in the state of Washington, indeed some of the poorest children in the nation. And I had a chance to learn early on what poverty looks like in the lives of our children and our families. So I have a huge commitment to equity in terms of income inequality and also education and how education is the foundation for people to getting ahead in our democracy. After, 30, after serving as a first grade teacher, I also taught special education. And then I went on to spend the last 20 years of my career supervising school principals. And in that role, I had 16 school principals, 12 from elementary schools, two from middle schools, and two from high schools. That accounted for 10,000 kids, 1,500 employees, and a lot of life experience doing that job. When I left Spokane, I moved here in 2005, 14 years ago, to be the policy director for Governor Chris Gregoire. And in that job, I had an opportunity to hire some of the smartest people in every aspect of state government. 
So that was a career of service that brought me to two years ago when I heard that Chris Rakedahl was leaving this seat to run for the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction. At that point in time, I realized that I still had a passion to serve, put my name on the ballot, and was honored when you elected me to be your state representative. This is the best job I have ever had, and I'm asking your, for your vote so I can continue to serve you. Thank you. And thank you both. And we're ready to start with our questions. See, you'll go first and you'll have two minutes. If elected, what are your top three priorities? Thank you for that question. In fact, my first priority is that the state begin to adopt policies of responsible spending and accountability. We had a biennium budget six years ago that was about $38 billion. Now our biennium budget is $52 billion. We're spending money, but we're not taking reasonable efforts to control spending. And this is a major problem because this money doesn't come down from heaven, this comes from the taxpayer. As I walk doors and talk, talk to taxpayers, they're concerned that their property tax is prohibitive. They are in fear of a state income tax, which will cost them even more of their money. They're upset that the gas tax in the state is the second highest in the entire nation, higher than California. Uh, taxation is the number one priority. Number two priority is crime. We have crime in the neighborhoods. We have crime on the street. As an example, the crime rate, the violent crime rate in Seattle is equivalent to the violent crime rate in Detroit. We have taken a policy of being soft on crime, and this is a, a threat to the community, a threat to working people. This is also unfair to people who have issues with drug abuse, because if we put those people where they can get treatment, that will reduce crime and that will help the community. I also feel that we are not taking the appropriate steps to address the environment. We, we use the environment as a vehicle for taxation rather than using innovative ideas in order to address environmental challenges. These, these ideas don't have to cost the taxpayers money. There are a lot of very innovative solutions that don't cost the taxpayers money and will have real meaningful effects to improve our environment. Thank you. Thank you, C. Lori, if elected, what are your top three priorities? You have one minute. Thank you, Allison. Um, my priorities remain the same as they were when I decided to run two years ago. Number one is K-12 funding. Um, education is a paramount duty of the state of Washington. As you're aware, we solved the McCleary lawsuit, but we have not solved K-12 funding. So with my background in K-12 budgets, I um, will make that a big goal of mine over this next year. Second of all, we live in a state with the most regressive tax structure in the United States, which is odd because we're a very progressive state, but our tax structure hurts the middle class and lower socioeconomic citizens of Washington state. We have no kind of tax in place that actually would tax the wealthiest individuals in Washington state, even though we have billionaires and millionaires, um, probably more than most states in Washington. What I would hope we would, could do this next session is pass a capital gains tax. I think an income tax is not doable right now. That would have to change the Washington State Constitution, but a capital gains tax could make a big difference in our revenue. Thank you, Lori. And we'll go on to the next question. Lori, you get to start with the first answer to the next question, and you'll have two minutes. Now that the McCleary lawsuit has been addressed, what else can be done to further improve Washington State's educational system? So the McCleary lawsuit was very, very important because what it did is it changed the fact that now we are going to um, pay for basic education from the state instead of from local government. Unfortunately, the way we solved that is we did it on property taxes. That was the wrong place to um, find money for K-12 education. State property taxes was not the right answer. It has put a lot of our citizens in a very bad way in last session when the state coffers actually got more money than we were expecting. We actually lessened the state property taxes for next year. In terms of K-12 funding, in solving McCleary, we lost a couple of things that are very important for K-12 funding. One would be we no longer had a statewide salary schedule, and if we're going to be paying for state for 
K-12 education from the state and bargaining at the local level, we need to have more of a connect between the state and local level. And so we've got to do something about a state salary schedule that says this is what the state will fund for basic education. So that's one piece. The other piece that I believe that we need to do something about has to do with um, the, the tax structure again. We need to go to a different mode of getting revenue into K-12 education. And we probably need to have a way for local citizens to still put the bells and whistles that they want in their kids' schools back into their schools. Public schools have always been owned by local citizens. When the elementary school is across the street from you, that's your elementary school. It's not like driving by the Department of Natural Resources where you don't feel the same ownership as you do in your own child's elementary school. So we need to also keep, maintain local voice in public education because it belongs to the local communities. Thank you, Laurie. See, you have one minute to answer the question and I'm happy to restate the question if need be. Sure, thank you. Okay, so the question is, now that the McCleary lawsuit has been addressed, what else can be done to further improve Washington State's educational system? You have one minute. What we need to do, or what we need to realize, is that just throwing money at a problem does not solve the problem. Yes, we have funded education, we have we've provided more money, but we haven't structurally changed the system to make it more effective and more efficient. Uh, for example, we have a 20% dropout rate from high school. Uh, dropout, a dropout rate is very significant because of people who drop out of high school, 85% of those people end up in prison. So we need to improve that. One of the places that we need to improve that is we need to put things in, in place that will ensure that people completing third grade are proficient readers, which is not currently the situation. And I believe that we have two important things that we need to take into consideration. We need to have parental choice when it comes to schools. Right now, our primary focus is traditional public schools, but we have very promising opportunities with charter schools, and we need to be encouraging those. We only have four, and we need to expand that. Thank you. Thank you. We're gonna to go to the next question and see you will have two minutes for an answer. The question is, do you think the legislature could or should assist in finding a solution for the statewide homeless problem? If so, what form might it take? And if not, why not? Thank you. That's a, that's a very popular question. Everybody likes to talk about homelessness. And, and it's a very vast issue. And, and I would like to try to address that by first pointing out that homelessness or the homeless community is not a monolith. We like to talk about the homeless community like it's one consistent group, but it's not. We have homeless veterans they have one issue. We have uh, homeless youth, they have different issues. We have drug addicts, they have different issues. We have an anarchists that, that use the homeless community, they have different issues. We have mentally and physically disabled people, they have different issues. So there is no one size fits all solution to this problem. Um, having said that, I think that it's important to recognize that homelessness is by and large uh, an issue for the cities However, just like the federal government can be invited in to help solve a problem, so can the state government be invited in to help solve a problem. I think that one way, one tool we can use to address some of the homeless situations is the notion of a triage. And I, the county is already doing something along those lines. I think we can expand that. There are a lot of wonderful programs for veterans. There's a group called the PTSD Foundation of America that is a veteran-run, veteran-funded program and has a tr tremendous success ratio helping homeless veterans and drug-addicted veterans reintegrate into society. So I think we can work with groups like that. I also think that we should partner with cities to set up barracks-type situations so that people who need immediate and temporary homelessness can rent a bed to sleep in with the idea that they must work towards transitioning back into the community. So these are some things we can look at. There is no one solution for all of this. Thank you. Thank you, C. Lori, you have one minute to answer the question. I'm happy to repeat the question if you'd like. I think I have it. Thanks, okay. Allison. So I think homelessness is um, 
a concern both in the local community at the state level and at the federal level. It is, um, there are many reasons that people are homeless. I had the opportunity to spend a year of my life working at Sidewalk, working with homeless veterans. That was important for me because my husband's a Vietnam veteran. My dad was a World War II veteran. My great grandfather was a Civil War veteran. And actually, one of my relatives fought at the Lexington Green in 1775, so history of veterans. What I know is that veterans that are homeless, about 60% of them that we were able to help at Sidewalk with just a little bit of money, if they could get themselves into an apartment where they could actually take a shower, cook themselves a meal, wash their clothes, they could find jobs. It is very hard to find any kind of meaningful job if you're on the street, worried about your safety and have no way to clean up to go to a job interview. So that kind of nonprofit work is really important. This, I'll stop there, ran out of time. Thank you. Lori, what is your position on single-payer health care for Washington State residents? And you have two minutes for an answer. So ultimately, I believe that we, as one of the richest nations in the world, should have health care for all of our citizens as just a right of being a citizen. Um, the fact that you can buy health care if you're rich, but not if you're poor, should not be the case in the United States of America. The single payer system, I think some of the steps getting us to that make a lot of sense to me. Um, the conversations that you've probably heard about taking Medicare and moving it down so maybe at 55 citizens could get Medicare, that makes a lot of sense. Right now in the state legislature, part of what we are constantly fighting against in this era of craziness coming out of Washington, D.C is mitigating against what comes to us. And in the terms of healthcare, that's what doesn't come to us. Because when federal funds are cut, it really impacts the good work we're doing in Washington State with the Apple Care and the different programs we have in place for our lower socioeconomic citizens. So healthcare is a complex situation. The talk of getting rid of pre-existing conditions if people really understood that, I think you would see demonstrations in the street because very few people I know don't have a pre-existing condition. And the purpose of healthcare is to give each of us a shot at being healthy and leading a meaningful life. So those are a lot of different ideas. It's a complex situation. We need to get money from the federal government. We need to keep passing good common sense legislation here in the state. Thank you, Lori. C, what is your position on single-payer health care for Washington State residents? And you have one minute. Let me, let me first say that health care in general uh, is, is a federal issue. There, there is only limited work that we can do at the state level on it. Most of the solutions are federally based. But health care is something that normally comes from your employer. So one of the solutions to health care is jobs. We need, to be, we need to be business friendly in the state. We need to have good jobs in the state. We need to encourage good jobs. We need to take care of our employers so that we have good jobs. Because when most people get their health care through their employer, employment is the critical issue. Uh, to expand that, and it, as I said, this more becomes a federal issue, but there are things that can improve health care throughout the country, and that is, of course, having uh, insurance companies be uh, permitted to sell across state lines, which they were up until the 1940s. Thank you. Thank you, C. And C, we'll give you the next question, and you'll have two minutes to answer. Revenue for counties in Washington state has been described as a two-legged stool. What can the legislature do to increase revenue for counties? You have two minutes. Well, that is a very good question. Um, you know, in the, uh, in the last uh, two years, we've, we've set up these opportunity zones within counties that uh, allow a tax def def deferment. It's a federal program that allows a tax def deferment. And with these opportunity zones, the state could get involved and further offer incentives for businesses to set up in these opportunity zones. Um, setting up businesses in these economic opportunity zones would allow more people to have good jobs in the counties. More people working, more jobs, 
would increase revenue in the counties without increasing any taxes. It's just simply putting people to work, especially putting people to work in rural counties because you know, right now we have an enormous amount of congestion in the, in the core of the Seattle area. I mean, Seattle is full and Seattle doesn't even want more jobs. Why not use these opportunity areas to set up businesses, to encourage businesses, to encourage uh, environmentally friendly businesses like solar businesses and so forth? Um, these, this is a great opportunity to create jobs and to increase revenue. Thank you. Thank you, C. Lori, you have one minute to answer the question and I can repeat the question if you'd like. I think I'm good with the question and I'm gonna go back to state revenue. Back in 2008, when the bottom fell out of our economy in the United States and in the state of Washington, there had been a lot more money going to local government from the state before that time. And when the money went away, that help to local government dried up I think as our economy has improved, the state has taken some steps to try to get more money to local government. And I'm gonna tie this into the homelessness question that we just discussed. Last session, the legislature passed House Bill 1570, which has to do with the document recording surcharge when you buy and sell homes. And we actually made it a permanent fee. It doesn't go away, it doesn't sunset, and it's now $62 with the intent that that money would be shared with the state, with the county, and local government to help fight homelessness. So that's just one example of how the state, by having the right revenue stream coming into the state, can help with local government, and I think that's very important. Thank you. Next question. Lori, we'll start with you, and you'll have two minutes. Would you support additional efforts to address mental health care in this state? If so, what form would it take? And if not, why? I absolutely would support additional efforts. I think one of the reasons so many people are homeless on the street or overloading our jails is because there's a lot of people with mental health problems that aren't getting the help they need. Um, we have passed in the House, in the Democratic Caucus, many bills that help folks with mental health to get services that they need. So we continue to work on it from that standpoint. But I'm gonna go back to money. Without money, if, if we only have money to pay for K-12 education, the paramount duty of the state, it's hard to teach little kids who are coming from homes with lot, lots of mental health disorders. We also need to be helping those children and those families on the mental health front. So it's going to take revenue to put more services into the mental health um, area. Our nonprofits do a really great job in that arena, but they can't do it without funding. Every day in my job during the session, people come to my office and explain to me pretty horrendous situations where they need uh, mental health services. And until we have enough um, funds to buy those mental health services, there's not much help that we can give. So. Everything we talk about in terms of state government goes back to how are you going to pay for it? And having been in 30 years of doing a K-12 budget and four years of doing a state budget with the governor, it's not like you're making choices about what are the important things to pay for and what are the things that aren't so important. It's like you have a choice of all important things. You have this much need and this much revenue. And so making sure that we have a steady stream of revenue to pay for these critical services like mental health is vital. Thank you, Lori. C, you have one minute to answer the question. And would you like me to repeat the question or? No, fine. I'm fine. Good. Mental health is a, is a very abstract term and not very well defined. Now, mental illness, on the other hand, is very well defined. Um, mental illness, we have programs, we have federal programs, we have SSI and so on and so forth. There are federal programs to address mental illness. Mental health becomes an issue that what is mental health? Who needs mental health services? And, and how do we determine, how do we find these people? We have to understand that you can't just go around pointing at people and say this person needs this, this person needs that. A person normally will have to come into the system by some means that is initiated with probable cause, a, a crime, an incident, and so forth. And then you have the opportunity to triage them and determine do they have a mental illness, do they need mental health services. Otherwise, we're just opening the door to a complete violation of all of our constitutional rights. The state does not have a right to be snooping as to our mental health. Thank you. 
Thank you both. And now we're at the last question before closing. And the last question, C, you'll start. How can the state of Washington address climate change? C, you have two minutes. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. I, I, I will probably would have put that in your basket to ask. Um, you know, right now we have, we have this absurd uh, initiative on the ballot, uh, 1631, uh, which is uh, all about generating revenue and not one bit about addressing carbon emission. Uh, I, in fact, have a carbon program. I, I propose that we offer the uh, 100 or 145 or so large carbon emitters tax incentives to install carbon collection systems on their output streams. This will, uh, this will motivate them to voluntarily come forward, because profit will be the motive, and capture their carbon. Their carbon is marketable. Carbon currently sells for $135 a ton. These 145 companies collectively emit 28 million tons of carbon a year. So my idea of bringing them to the table to collect their carbon potentially will remove 28 million tons of carbon a year and won't cost the taxpayers any money. On the other hand, the, uh, the carbon tax will raise your gas price by 42 cents a gallon, will raise your electric cost by 15% will raise the cost of everything in the state, but it will do nothing to remove carbon from the atmosphere. So we have a clear choice, revenue generating or actually stepping up and fixing things in the environment. Thank you. Thank you, C. Lori, your opinion for one minute. How can the state of Washington address climate change? Thank you, Allison. I am a proud supporter of Initiative 1631. I believe that our largest polluters need to pay a price for that, but not just to punish them because the money that they're going to be paying is going to be used for clean energy. It's going to be used for rural broadband so people don't have to get in their cars, they can do more on the internet. It's going to be used for mass transit. All the things that will make our clean, our water cleaner, our air cleaner, our um, climate cleaner. And so I think that initiative has been well thought out People came to the table and did it as a group, unlike the initiative from last time that there was some infighting among the group sh who should have all been in support of it. This initiative comes to the ballot with the support from very many groups, and um, I think it will make a big difference. Thank you. Thank you both. And now we're going to have closing statements. You'll have one minute each. Lori, you get to go first. Uh, you have one minute for your closing statement. Thank you, Allison. As I started out in my opening, it has been my honor to serve you these past two years. This is really the best job I've ever had. And the reason it's so great is it's a citizen legislature. So every day you go there with people from all walks of life who bring different skills to the table. And I love finding common ground with people. It's what I've done with my life. So when you walk into the legislature where you're dealing with half the people who politically might seem different than you, the dark secret, actually it's not a dark street secret, the happy secret is that the people on that floor, like 85% of the time, are in agreement on bills. So it's just a few um, critical pieces where we have a lot of disagreement, and those are the ones that get the media attention. But the truth is we find common ground more often than we don't. So I enjoy that. The other thing I enjoy is people. And this job, you have to really like people because you have to be very visible in your community. And it's part lawmaking, but there's a huge part of this job that's social work. So um, I like all that. I would, again, appreciate your vote because I want to continue to do this work. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. See, you can close us out with a one-minute closing statement. Thank you. When you hear about regressive taxation, remember, property tax is the most regressive form of taxation. We work hard and often for many decades to pay off our homes so that we will have a secure place to live and something to pass on to future generations. We need to lower property tax so that it is no longer a threat to homeowners. We must also change the tax foreclosure laws to be more protective of property owners' rights. I will be your voice in the legislature to fight against the income tax, the mileage tax, the carbon tax, which will add 42 cents per gallon to gasoline, and to the other abusive taxes that they have planned. It is not true that state government needs more money. What is true, state government needs to spend more wisely and curb its endless thirst for revenue. 
Washingtonians have had enough of business as usual, and this year is time for us to take back our state and our country from the establishment elites. I ask you for your vote so that I can represent the interests of working people, small business, and entrepreneurs. This year, your vote really does count. Thank, thank you, C, and thank you, Lori. Thank you for joining us. We greatly appreciate it. And thank you for participating in the League of Women Voters General Election Forum for the 22nd Legislative District. We encourage viewers to vote in the general election on November 6, 2018. Remember, ballots are postage free now, so just put the ballot in the mail. The League particularly thanks Thurston Community Media for their ongoing support and assistance. And thank both of you again. We greatly appreciate you joining us today.